Hello again. In this video, we're going to talk about remodeling and maintenance of bone. After this, I'd like you to be able to define bone remodeling and answer which type of bone typically remodels faster, describe the minerals stored in high quantities within bone, explain why minerals would be released from bone, and describe how different factors affect bone deposition and resorption. So after growth is completed, bone does not suddenly become stagnant. Bone remodels constantly throughout our lives. It'll change shape and maintain its strength and resilience. The remodeling process clears out old bone that may have a weaker blood supply or a weaker structure with new healthy bone. Remodeling happens at different rates and it happens a lot faster in spongy bone versus compact. So the process of remodeling starts with resorption in which osteoclasts remove and break down bone matrix and release minerals into the blood. So as a majority of some of our minerals are stored in bone, like 99% of calcium, bone is the source of these minerals if they're needed elsewhere and resorption is the way to free them. Deposition is a process by which osteoblasts lay down new bone. Both of these processes can happen in response to many different triggers, including mechanical loading, putting stresses on those bones, endocrine signals, or changes in the mineral concentration in the blood. So many different types of cells are involved in bone remodeling. So osteoprogenitor cells, osteoblasts, and osteoclasts are found in well-vascularized areas near the periosteum, the endosteum, and within these per uh, perpendicular interosteonic canals. Now the network of osteocytes will send strains on the bone. So something that I like to think of with this sort of a process is thinking about the children's game Red Rover. If you have not played it or have no idea what I'm talking about, let's talk through what happens in Red Rover. So imagine two groups of kids standing across from one another. We'll draw them here as their heads were looking down from the sky and they're holding hands. So this group over here says, Red Rover, Red Rover, send this person over. And then this person comes running at the arms to try and break that, try to get through that and then take people with them to the other side, I think is the goal. Either way, what happens here is these kids are holding on their hands really tight and they're able to feel probably through the whole line where that break was trying to be made. So this is sort of how those osteocytes are feeling. They're able to communicate with one another and feel changes in their line of communication and say, this spot right here is weak and we need some reinforcement there. So in response to these strains, osteocytes can recruit any type of cell needed for that area of bone. Perhaps it is a weak area of bone, we need an osteoclast to come in to remove that weak bone so that osteoblasts can deposit new bone. So let's talk a little bit more about mechanical loading. We touched on this with appositional growth as the stresses and strains on a bone can add bone directly on the surface of it. So each of our skeletons will actually differ based on the specific activities that we do and how our bones are stressed. And this mechanical load you can also think would come from gravity. So mechanical load in general will lead to bone deposition. When there's a pull or a push on the bone, it will want to strengthen itself and build on it. So I'd like you to take a few minutes to pause and answer the two questions in the gray box. Questions are, which bone cells are active, activated by mechanical loading? And then how do you think bone density would change in zero gravity and maybe how would astronauts counteract these changes? All right, so which type of bone cell is most active 
are most activated by mechanical loading or any pressures put on the bone. This is going to be osteoblasts, as osteoblasts lead to bone deposition. So how do you think that bone density would change in zero gravity? Well, this leads to decreases in bone density. And this can be at a rate of 1 to 2% per month. And to put it in perspective, that's the amount of bone that is lost in an aged person per year. So you can imagine this would really add up over time if this person were at the International Space Station for a whole year. So one way that astronauts do counteract this is through exercise. You probably thought of that given the image. And they will exercise about two and a half hours a day with harnesses to hold them down on treadmills and using resistance bands. Aside from mechanical stresses and strains, which ultimately lead to new bone deposition, many extrinsic factors also affect the functioning bone cells. So during growth spurts and puberty, sex hormones and growth hormones are much more prevalent and they play a big role in the growth of bones. So in general, their presence will lead to an increase in bone deposition. Calcitonin is a hormone secreted by the thyroid gland. It plays an important role in blood calcium regulation, as the name would tell you. And specifically, it leads to storing of calcium through bone deposition. So that will lead to an increase in bone deposition, storing that calcium away, while also leading to a decrease in bone resorption to remove less calcium from the bone. Now, the other side of the calcium regulation coin is through the secretion of the parathyroid hormone. And this is through the parathyroid gland found on the posterior aspect of the thyroid gland. So this leads to increased resorption, which removes minerals from the bone, freeing them up for use elsewhere. Now the amount of calcium we absorb in our diets is dependent on the presence of vitamin D. So vitamin D, calcium, and phosphate are all needing to be present to allow for bone deposition to happen properly. Now the basics of calcium homeostasis is related then to that balance of calcitonin and parathyroid hormone. So I have here just a summary of how it relates to the rest of the body as well. We're going to focus here on how it affects bone minerals, and you'll see a lot more about this in the future, but I just wanted to give you that heads up. So in response to high serum calcium, calcitonin is released. The release of calcitonin leads to calcium being deposited into bones. So this is an increase in bone deposition. This also leads to less absorption and more excretion of calcium through the digestive system and the renal system. So in the case of low serum calcium, we'll see that the parathyroid hormone is secreted from these parathyroid glands, and that leads to the liberation or the, the removal of the minerals from the bones to increase that serum concentration. The other thing that happens in response to parathyroid hormone would be more absorption in the GI tract and, and more reabsorption in the renal system. Now here I'm going to take us on a bit of a tangent, so this goes kind of beyond what is uh, testable for the course, but I want to note that calcium phosphate and vitamin D are not the only vitamins and minerals essential for bone health. So the maintenance of bone requires the intake and absorption of many of these essential vitamins and minerals. However, in this case, excess can lead to the opposite effect, so balance is key. Along with calcium and phosphate, magnesium and fluoride can be directly stored in that bone matrix. 
Fluoride is something you might think about with teeth or with toothpaste or in the water. So fluoride can be part of fluoroapatite, basically a little substitution for hydroxyapatite. And this is found in our teeth. We can also find this crystal in our bones. Now vitamin D as well as adequate potassium and vitamin K are essential for the proper absorption, transport, and incorporation of calcium and phosphate. Now the rest listed here are important cofactors for the synthesis of proteins and the maintenance of bone metabolism. However, the main three, the ones I've outlined here, calcium, phosphate, and vitamin D, are definitely important, they are essential, and they're most frequently deficient. And there are tons of papers on which vitamins and minerals are essential for bone health if you're looking for a fun afternoon activity. Now here we're going to answer an open-ended question. So I'd like you to pause and write down everything you remember about bone deposition. I've listed a few ideas of what to include here to jog your memory. Now when you're ready, let's start with the basics. What is bone deposition? So this is the formation of new bone. Now this includes bringing together the parts of the extracellular matrix and the calcification of it. Now which cells are more involved in bone deposition? So osteoblasts build bone, so osteoblasts. What are osteoclasts involved in? That'll be bone resorption or the removal of bone tissue. Now what are our essential vitamins and minerals? One of the biggest ones here we'll see is calcium. Then we have phosphate. And then finally, vitamin D. And as I discussed, it is not that simple. However, these are the main ones that you want to know. Now, which factors lead to increased bone deposition? So exercise or any mechanical loading on these bones can lead to growth in the bones. We'll see growth hormones and sex hormones. And also calcitonin. Calcitonin was that hormone from the thyroid gland. Do you remember what the major hormone that opposes calcitonin is? That will be the parathyroid hormone that will increase bone resorption. Great. Thanks for your attention. I'll see you in the next one.